Encuentra la libertad durante los Jeep Freedom Days. Arrendatarios retornantes FCA bien calificados se rindan a bajo millaje la nueva Grand Cherokee WK Laredo i4x4 2022 de dos filas por 359 al mes por 24 meses con 6,609 al firmar. Impuesto, título y placa no incluidos. No requiere depósito. Llama al 1-888-925-G para detalles. Requiere contribución de agencia y arriendo con US Bank. Cargo extra por milla sobre 20,000. Restricciones por residencia. Toma entrega para el 5 de julio del 22. Jeep es una marca registrada. Frontier presents a tale of two homes. I moved in with Frontier Gig Fiber and have been gaming and surfing up a storm with super fast speeds. And I moved in without it and haven't. So you don't have a 100% fiber optic network with 99.99% overall reliability? That's correct. 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 Well, it's never too late to upgrade. Don't just move. Move up. Switch to Frontier Gig Service for just $69.99 a month with auto pay and get a $200 Visa reward card on us. Go to Frontier.com slash moving for complete offer details. Services subject to availability and all applicable terms and conditions. Impact of Influence. The tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Hello, friend. It's Matt Harris and Seton Tucker. So grateful that you are here with us. And you can reach out to us, Seton, where, how, why? You can reach out to us on our Facebook page, which is Murdoch Podcast, or on our website, which is MurdochPodcast.com. This is interesting because last episode, you brought up Eddie Smith, and we had audio from Eric Bland discussing Eddie Smith and what might come down, which was audio from a episode that we released a few months ago. But you brought it back up, and the timing couldn't have been better, so you nailed it, because the straight state grand jury, South Carolina, indicted Alec Murdoch and cousin Eddie, Curtis Edward Smith, for criminal conspiracy and narcotics. Right, so he was arrested, actually, last Friday, which was June 24th, in Colleton County, and he was transported to Columbia for his bond hearings, actually at the same jail that Alec Murdoch is at. So if you don't remember who Curtis Eddie Smith was, he was the person who was accused of trying to shoot Alec Murdoch last Labor Day in this kind of insurance fraud scheme. It was a suicide for hire so that Alec could get money uh, for Buster. Right. Let's go to the indictments. The state grand jury alleges uh, this is from... The press release from Attorney General Alan Wilson. The state grand jury alleges a criminal conspiracy regarding approximately 437 checks, totaling approximately $2.4 million, that went from Murdoch to Smith from October 7th, 2013 through February 28th, 2021. The two were also indicted in an alleged conspiracy regarding the distribution and purchase of oxycodone. Smith is indicted for counts of money laundering over $100,000 regarding the alleged disposition of the checks. The state grand jury also charged Smith with forgery for allegedly forging endorsements on some of the checks. Smith is also indicted for three other drug offenses, including allegedly trafficking over 10 grams of methamphetamine. Altogether, through 16 indictments containing 81 charges against Murdoch, the state grand jury has indicted Murdoch for schemes to defraud victims of $8.5 million. I mean, this is the first time we've heard about a drug connection. I mean, we, 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 we've heard about a drug connection, but this is the first time from law enforcement that the distribution and trafficking of drugs being connected to Alec Murdoch and Eddie Smith. Because we have heard about Alec's uh, addiction to opioids. There's been a mention sometime over the last eight months or so of the drug cartel or gang called the Cowboys that hangs out in the uh, low country. And now there is a firm connection in Alec Murdoch purchasing drugs, allegedly, and he's being charged with distribution. So he had quite a few pills or some sort of uh, methamphetamine or oxycodone. And Eddie Smith faces a very wide range. It's, what, three? Three, three to 122 years. Yeah, that's quite, quite a range. And so he was in front of the judge 
Yes, he was in front of Judge Newman, who is the same judge who Alec Murdoch was in front of. And let's hear what he had to say. Smith, would you like to say anything regarding the bond? Yes, sir, Your Honor. I don't have any money. All the money that, he, that, that Mr. Moore is talking about, Ellen Murray got all that. I didn't get none of it. I don't have any money. All I have is my disability I live off of. That's it. I live in a modest house on a small piece of property. My automobile was 10, 15 years old. I don't have any access to money like that. People they were talking about at my house uh, were renting a shop of mine that I had back in the back right there. He was doing some work in it. I don't know who I was in the, in the shop right there at the time. I was in my house, you know, whenever this all was happening. Anything else? I'm not going anywhere, Your Honor. I look forward to clearing my name. So Eddie looks forward to clearing his name. The, and I found it interesting there that he talks about a shop that it sounds like he say he rented out. And he says he, does, he didn't know who was back there. Which makes me jump to, and we don't know yet because nothing has been released about the specifics, but it makes me jump to the thought that either the opioids were found there or the meth or whatever it was was either found in there or they are saying it was uh, produced in there or sold in there because it seems to me that Eddie is distancing himself from what happened in that shop. Yes. So there could be something, some criminal enterprise that was going on in this shop, which will tie Alec and uh, Cousin Eddie into some maybe some bigger scheme. I, I, you know, who knows? But that, that the shop thing really just jumped out at me. We had to listen to it several times before we just kind of wrapped our heads around it. Right. Now, we also want to mention that Cousin Eddie, it, it said during the this hearing, has been cooperating with authorities. Right. So he did receive a bond. He did get a surety bond for $250,000 with the conditions of house arrest, an ankle monitor, and drug testing. And he says he was dragged into the whole thing. I want to add to this, as I, as I you know, we talked about the, the Cowboys gang, uh, there's been many articles throughout the last, uh, I guess, few months. Um, one here from MSN that talks about uh, the Walterboro area gang called the Cowboys. Walterboro, right next to Hampton, very close. Uh, and then I, I, I pulled it up and was bouncing around multiple articles about the Cowboys, uh, including justice.gov released something in uh, 2017 about arresting eight members. But then as I just typed in the, the gang thing, uh, this popped up, which I think was interesting, from Live 5 News in 2013. A Live 5 News investigation uncovered a new violent gang in Collington County. Collin County Sheriff's Office investigators say the Cowboys gang may be responsible for the murder of an innocent woman outside a nightclub on July 14th. They are now calling this gang the most violent gang in the country. Lieutenant Jason Chapman, who heads up the special response team and monitors gang activity, said, quote, they're extremely dangerous, mostly because they're trying to make a name for themselves. They're bringing it to our attention through videos. And uh, that really is starting to pop that there might be a tie-in now. Yeah. And I don't, people who are not familiar with the area, Walterboro is right on I-95. So, and it's, you know, Florida, kind of halfway between Florida and New York. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it does seem naturally that it would be a place that maybe drug activity would happen. Now, we don't know, but those kind of whispers suddenly become more than just whispers. The next part of this podcast, we will warn you, is not specifically about the Alec Murdoch and the Murdoch cases. It's just something we thought would be interesting to those who have been following this or, or wonder about what the low country is all about. Yes, we get a ton of emails and comments about pronunciations of names and places. So we thought it'd be a great time to bring on an expert. Um, but if you are only here for Murdoch mess stuff, then you might just want to fast forward and join us again next week. That's right. But uh, and, and enjoy your lesson in dialect and language. Glad to be joined by a PhD assistant professor at the Department of Communication Disorders uh, at the University of Alabama. He is Paul Reed. Hi, Paul. Hello. 
And glad to have you, man. Uh, you've also spent some time at the University of South Carolina with the Gamecocks. Uh, so yep. Yep. was it was it because you were there that you started going into the Southern dialect or you were attracted to the Southern dialect and then went to USC? Uh, a little bit of both. So uh, I grew up in East Tennessee and been fascinated by, by language and, and sound, you know, basically my whole life. And so I uh, kind of had a little, little bit of a circuitous route to get to, uh, to get to my PhD, but came to USC uh, knowing that I wanted to study language and study, you know, language variation, um, wasn't really sure where, and then took a class uh, from Dr. Tracy Weldon while at South Carolina on varieties of American English, and kind of found kind of found my niche. And so, uh, you know, as a, as a professional Southerner, I you know wanted to wanted to study home. So I started studying this the variation um, among Southern English, and in particular in Appalachian English. So, but uh, you know, being in South Carolina for uh, for seven and a half years. Um, you got to kind of get interested in just the the cool history and, and all of the variation in the Palmetto State. I read your uh, South Carolina public radio article, and you kind of uh-huh. described these four main areas of Southern dialect in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. let's start with that. Sure. So when you start thinking about South Carolina, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because the the state and how people refer to the state kind of give you a little bit of uh, of that uh, indication. So you've got the Low Country, you've got the PD. Uh, you've got the Midlands, and then you've got the Upstate, and that roughly corresponds to uh, to you know sort of the language variation there. So um, you've got the Upstate, which is more like uh, Appalachian English. So it, it's basically take the Southern dialect, and just most of the features are just more common, more frequent, or they take like the next step. So again, you know, you think you go, you know, you go past uh, Columbia about fifty or seventy-five miles. And you start getting into that, and by the time you get to Greenville, Spartanburg, and then on up to the, uh, you know, what what people call the dark corner, uh, you're you're well in Appalachian English range. There in the Midlands, it's sort of a, a transition. There's a lot of southern features, but be, you know, it's kind of dominated by uh, a fairly large urban area, and so you get a little bit of difference because you have so many people coming from across the state uh, and honestly across the nation with with Fort Jackson there in Columbia. So you get a little bit of a difference. So there's still a lot of southern features. Um, but then there's it's sort of leveled a little bit because of just uh, how much movement uh, is there, especially you know because it's the state capital. There's a large university and then uh, the, uh, the the army post. So there's a lot of just there, but it's not quite as 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 upfront as other places. When you start as you you know start going to the east and you get into the PD, you start transitioning from that sort of uh, leveled out southern to where you get into what we would call the coastal south. And there you have a lot of features that um, are, are where you get a lot more of the southern features, and we'll, I'm sure we'll probably talk more about those, but you get a lot more of what we call the southern bowel shift. But then in particular, because of South Carolina's relatively unique history uh, as compared to a couple other southern states, you have more more and interesting things. And then as you get into the low country, you have those same things, and you add in things like where R's after vowels – uh, aren't necessarily produced as much. Now that's kind of on its way out, but um, it's still there, especially in the speech of people that are say 50 and older. I mean, depending on the person, they could be even younger in doing that. And then, of course, you kind of have Charleston, which is sort of it, it's its own thing. Yeah. Which Charleston has that uh, where there's no R's after vowels. So that's sort of its traditional thing, but that's kind of been dying out. And then there's a couple other southern features that are found in most other parts of the state that aren't necessarily found in Charleston. So in most of the rest of the state, we have this, this sort of process called monophthongization. And so what that means is where, in some words, you have uh, where there are two vowel sounds kind of mushed together. So uh, it's like if you take the word M-Y, so my, mm-hmm. if you say that, you can sort of tell how that your, your mouth starts in one sound, the ah, and it moves to the E, so I, my. my. In lots of parts of South Carolina, people don't always do that. So they kind of just have one sound. So it goes from you know a diphthong, which means two sounds, to a monophthong, which is one sound. So that's why it's called monophthongization. So it goes from my to ma. my. And that happens oh. in lots of the state. You know, kind of happens in the upstate, happens in the Midlands, happens in the PD, and then happens in the Low Country. Charleston is a little different because that didn't necessarily 
stick as much. So there are some cool papers coming uh, around the, the turn of the, the turn of the millennium, and Charleston really didn't have that as much. It was kind of its own thing, and so that makes Charleston and sort of the the, the, the and its surroundings a little bit different uh, than the rest of the state. So in Charleston, you know, the people I know that have what's called the Charleston accent, it's a, it's yep. kind of it's kind of a uppity, richy kind rich kind of thing, right? Would that would that am I on to something there? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times because that that type of 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 Southern speech is one that was typically associated with a lot of upper class speakers historically. Mm-hmm. So right, you know that right. you know let's go down to the hob, or we're going to see you know go to the ships in the hob. But that that kind of sound yeah, right yeah. there that tended to be associated with people that had you know more wealth right, just just right. historically. Now, not not everybody, but that no. it, there was that association made in the minds of speakers. Mm-hmm. And so um, that still happens to this day. So, I mean, you kind of notice that when, uh, like, for example, when people win a statewide office or, or, or something like that, sometimes they sound a little more Charlestonian than they actually do <laughs> in, yes, in, yes. in you know, sort of regular life. Or people that aren't necessarily even from Charleston might sound like that. And if you think about some of the, uh, like, popular media uh, portrayals of, of South Carolina, mm-hmm. people sound like they're from Charleston, even when they're supposed to be from – Seneca was, or Greenville or, or you know, somewhere they don't sound like that in Greenville and Seneca, but you know the portrayal of them is is like that. Yeah, Charleston kind of and because of that historical importance of the port and the and how you know it was it was the holy city. So I mean there there was a lot of cachet uh, mm-hmm. to sound like you were from Charleston. Now let's go to the the Low Country where this whole Murdoch thing uh-huh. is happening. Seton, what would you like to ask him about that? Well, I mean, we have gotten so many questions about the pronunciation of Alec Murdoch's name. Uh, some, <laughs> yep. Uh, so let's just dive straight into that. Mm, like, sure. it's, it's spelled for those who know it's L A L E X, which many people say Alex, M U R D A U G H. At the beginning of this, when you heard national news, they were calling it Murdoch, uh-huh. or, or sometimes, uh-huh. or sometimes uh, Murdoch. Is so there was different ways people are saying it. Explain how that breaks down. So obviously when you see a name like that, um, it it, it is a, it's a name from the British Isles. And and just with that spelling with the A-U-G-H, that's kind of a big cue that that's, that's coming from, from, from there. And if you look in the history of the name, it is a, it's a Scottish, it's a Scottish surname. And when you look back in the historical record, there are all sorts of spellings of it. When you get into Scotland, when you get into to Northern England and, and is into Scotland and also over in, in Ireland, they've not always been well, English speakers. That they speak Scots and they speak other other Celtic languages, and so they had a different spelling uh, conventions. And so that uh, you know A U G H sort of captured what we would sort of spell in English today as like O C K or maybe O C or mm-hmm. or something along those lines. So right. that's so the but that that sort of spelling convention captured the production of what would be like Murdoch. Mm-hmm. Now the, the 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 vowel in the dock, where some people say it's almost more like, you know, dock and some people say it almost sounds a little bit more like duck. It, it's just a matter of the, those those are those are vowel sounds made sort of in the back of the mouth. And this is, you know, this is a very scientific term. Vowels are very squirrely. Um, they move around mm-hmm. a lot, and especially vowels that are that that sound that aw sound. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that have two vowels, so they have like an aw and an aw. So that's like the difference in like c o t caught and c a u g h t caught. But there's also lots of people that don't have that distinction. So they say caught and caught. And they don't make a distinction. So that vowel sound is sort of one that it moves a little bit. And and the the cool thing is so when I was looking back into the sort of the history of the name, that's been around for a long, long time. So like when you look back at how various people attempted to spell the name, especially when English you know, people from England were, were writing about people in northern England and in, in Scotland and, and, and thereabouts, they spelled it all sorts of different ways. So you've got D-O-C, you've got D-A-C, you've got D-U-C, you've got mm. D-U-K, all sorts of stuff where that idea of what that vowel was is is kind of – it's kind of uh, squirrely. It just moves yeah, around yeah. because in in the, in English spelling, we don't do a great job of representing how things are 
pronounced and how we spell things. I mean, if you think about it, if you ask any of your friends or people that you know that that grew up in nations like, you know, in France or in Spain or in Italy or or lots of places, the idea of a spelling bee is kind of foreign because if you can say something, you can usually spell it. But in English, that (laughs) doesn't necessarily work. Wow, I never thought of that. Yeah. It doesn't make sense sometimes. Exactly. Let's take a break and give a big thank you to Incogni for helping us out, sponsoring the podcast. What they do is they they solve one of the biggest problems we all face today. It's that our personal data is being shared and used without our permission. Yes, I've spent the week buried in emails, trying to get off lists, and I think you should let Incogni do all the messy work for you automatically. Absolutely. You can protect your privacy by taking your personal data off the market. You actually can do that, but you don't want to go through those steps. You want Incogni to do it. They will request your personal data removal and deal with any objections that might come. And the first 100 people who use the code Murdoch will get 20% off. Again, the code is M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H, Murdoch, at incogni.com slash Murdoch. Take control of your data. We'll take a break and uh, talk about our newest sponsor. It is Gobble. They give you gourmet meal kits right to your doorstep. Last night, I had the ribeye steak, Diane. Sounds fancy, doesn't it? And I was able to make it, and I'm... No uh, genius chef, that is for sure. Yeah, so 15-minute meal kits delivered to your doorstep, that speaks to my heart. You get it done. Yes. Kids are waiting, I'm hungry! And you can do this. They they have an executive chef that curates each recipe, so you can create this complex, flavorful meal in just minutes, like you said, and uh, it's just... It's all ready to go. It's great. It's fantastic. Meals start at eleven ninety nine per serving. Members can choose between two or four person meal plans, as well as select between classic or lean or clean plans, depending on their meal preferences. Visit gobble.com slash Murdoch 636 to get your first six gobble meals for just 36 bucks. It's great. If you're like me and my family, a lot of stress just to figure out what's for dinner. Gobble takes that away because they give you that whole meal And you're ready to roll. Gobble.com slash Murdoch 636 to get your first six gobble meals for just 36 bucks. That's gobble.com slash M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H 636 to get your first six gobble meals for just 36 bucks. How do we arrive at Alec? Some people say Alec. Some people say Alec. And that sort of gets into the, the 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 southern the southern the southern U.S. speech. So that that's that's a vowel sound that's made towards the front of the mouth, and so you get. Again, just a little bit uh, uh, of difference, and especially because it's followed immediately by an L sound. And if you think about when you when you make the L sound, you know you sort of raise uh, the tip of your tongue towards the little ridge behind your upper front teeth, and air and sound go around the sides uh, of your uh, uh, of your tongue. That sort of makes some certain changes sometimes, in, in the vowels are around it, especially if there's a vowel before it, and especially when it's in that. Uh, you know, in that in that position, that sort of ah can be ah, it can be raised a little bit and sound a little bit more like eh, and that's where you get that elic, the alec and versus elic, and uh, and then also uh, there's a there's a lot of people in in that are English speakers just ac- across the English speaking world, but also in particular in in certain varieties in the U.S. that it, in vowels that are really short. They will make them even shorter. So they, uh, you know, so the difference between like a ah and a uh is where your tongue goes. And if you if you have to immediately move your tongue to go make that l sound, you may shorten the vowel even more. So it, you're not going to get a full ah. You may get something that's a little bit more like uh, uh yeah. and that's where the alec alec sort of comes from. And again, that's also associated with um, that part of the Low Country because uh, again, there's some of those things sort of. Co- correspond to what we call that that southern vowel shift, where those front vowels, so the the sound in like a ah sounds in like e, eh, and the sounds in e uh, move a little bit. So I was criticized because I actually mistakenly, and I'd I'd seen the sign and I'd heard of the place, but I made the mistake of calling Okati Okati. So uh-huh. what, what do you think about that? Um, so place names are are just are notorious okay so um when i first moved to columbia you know there's there's a street h u g e 
are. Huger. And if you are not from, <laughs> if you are not from South Carolina, you look at that and you say huger, right? right. Or, yeah. or something, or something along something those like lines. That, yeah. So my first two weeks in in Columbia, I was like, I need to get to Huger Street. And of course, people would give you that. Oh, bless your heart, look. <laughs> and then they would, and then then I would sort of get the correction. But so place names are are always interesting because there's lots of places that don't always correspond or you kind of have to be a local to know. And especially with the, like what you did with the, the shifting of the stress, right? So which, which syllable is the longest and the loudest? So, uh, you know, whether it's oak tree or oak tree, you know, that's your, you're shifting the stress. Oh yeah. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of, of English words tend to have stress on that second syllable, like, like you put it, but in the South, in certain parts of the South, we put a lot more stress on most of the initial syllables. So if you think about like, you know, a lot of us have car insurance and we carry umbrellas and we celebrate Thanksgiving and we celebrate oh. Halloween and we, you know, we, we, we smoke cigars and we play guitars, right? <laughs> so we put a lot of stress on that first syllable. So sometimes that extends to other words that we, you know, that, that again, if there's a chance to, I sort of tell my students, and I joke, if, 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 a, if you give a Southerner a chance to stress the first syllable, we're probably going to. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what we do. That, I, I recognize it when you say it, but I, now I, I can hear it in my head a bunch of times about people saying with the, the, that first syllable. Like, right. I, I, you exactly. just don't, you don't Umbrella. think about it. Yeah. What about exactly. y'all? I mean... Ooh. Let's go okay, over the origin of y'all. Yeah. Oh, it is? Oh, good. He likes his y'all. So, okay. Y'all is fascinating. And so I, I'm, I'm going to briefly summarize, and I have to mention it because he was a huge mentor to me. He was he, he was the professor at USC, and he was on my dissertation committee. But a lot of this comes from the work of Dr. Michael Montgomery. Rest in peace. Um, he was a fellow East Tennessean like me, um, fellow Maryville College grad like me. And he was, he's the giant upon whose shoulders I stand. So wow. uh, he, he's, he's this uh, very special human, but he looked into the history of y'all. And so obviously if you break it down, it's like you all, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it all stems from the fact that in, in older varieties of English, you could have, you know, you had I, and then you had thou, and then you had you. So the thou was when you were talking to one person. So if you think about like in the in the King James uh, Bible, and if you think in you know certain uh, you know older literatures, thou is there, mm-hmm. and it's always talking to like what we would say today is you. Thou shalt but not steal. You yeah. itself was plural, so you were talking to a group of people. Okay. So and then over time, they kind of got um, where the 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 thou fell out of favor, and you expanded. So then now you know if you think about it. If I, could, if I walk into a room and there's you know a few people in there, I say, how are you? It's ambiguous, right? It could mm-hmm. be I'm talking to one person or I could be I'm talking to all of them. Mm-hmm. So in lots of varieties of English, we've done something to sort of fill that little gap. So we're, now we treat you as being singular, and then we have something else for plural. So in, you know, the most famous example is y'all. I think it's the best. But there's also you know, people <laughs> say like, you guys. Yeah. People say Yuns or yep, Ewans. Pittsburgh, yeah. uh, in, in Pittsburgh and thereabouts, they say Yins. Yep. Um, in other parts of the Northeast Corridor, they'll say like Yous. Yeah. And so there's all they'll of these it. things that we've done to sort of make that plural you. Now, you, y'all is interesting because it sort of comes from two sources. There's the you all, which again sort of makes sense if you break it down like the you, but all of you. Mm-hmm. And then there was another form coming from Scots and the Scots Irish that was ye. All. So basically, it would be spelled today like Y-E-A-W. Hmm. And if you hear, you know, you all, or, or you know, and you, as it gets mushed together, y'all, and then you hear ye all, and when it gets mushed together, y'all, oh, it's yeah. very indistinguishable. And so you had sort of two sources that kind of mutually reinforced one another in and across the South. And so that by the fact that there were two sources that sounded very similar and it just sort of stuck. And then, of course, it's also incredibly useful. Like, I mean, anybody that has moved that the U.S. not a southerner that moves into the south, the first thing they usually adopt mm-hmm. is y'all. Yeah. And uh, I mean, because it's just so handy. <laughs> it, is, it is. It is very handy. And there's a lot of you mentioned the Scots because there's a lot of uh, Scots, Georgia and South Carolina, uh, mm-hmm. you know, way, mm-hmm. way back. Right. There was a lot of Scottish people set up home there. 
Yeah. So they're, they're, I mean, yeah. When you think about the, the settlement of uh, of that the interior of the South, uh, in in particular, there's lots of, uh, of Scots, Scotch Irish, uh, lots of uh, Irish people came, um, different parts of England. A, a lot of the people that settled along the coasts were from southeastern England. Um, and which is why, you know, there are a lot of the coastal places have that, you know, they don't say the R's after vowels. And a lot of the pl- people that settled in the interior were from southwestern England and, and, and in northern England and Scotland and Ireland. And so those places do say the R after vowels. And so that's why usually there's kind of a, in almost every southern state, there's sort of a coast inland split. Right. Um, and and part, a lot of that goes back to sort of the, the first English speakers that settled there and then the subsequent waves. Uh, and then, of course, there's all sorts of other factors, you know, the immigration patterns and migration and then um, other other languages that were spoken there, the languages that were spoken before the English speakers arrived, um, all sorts of things like that, too. Well, Scarlett O'Hara taught me that there were some Irish in uh, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> also, also the Gola. So what influence does the Gola culture have on the accent? Well, we should explain. Most people don't know about Gola. Oh, yeah. Around the, around the land, around the world. Like, explain the, the, the Gola before you go into their, their dialect, uh, Dr. Sure. Reed. So um, Gullah sometimes, uh, or often referred to as Gullah Geechee, um, is what is known as a Creole language. Um, it is actually, and this is sort of makes it really unique, it is the only English-based Creole in the continental United States. Hmm. So what a Creole language is, it, 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 it's a language that arises from a meeting of cultures. Now, sadly, most of the Creoles arose from um, colonization and or enslavement. There are some others that sort of arose from like um, trade or, or some things like that. But the majority of the Creoles, which tend to be found in the Caribbean and a few other places, are you know again results of colonization and enslavement. What what tends to happen is you have one group that is has been displaced. Uh, and so if you think about like the the low country of South Carolina, you have. Um, People stolen from their homeland in Africa, and they spoke lots of different languages. Uh, when you think about the west coast of Africa, it's one of the most linguistically diverse places in the world. And so you have people that were from all sorts of different language backgrounds brought together. Now, and then they're put in an environment where English is sort of the, 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 the lingua franca or the thing that is spoken that you know everyone is going to use or, or needs to use or needs to understand in some in some capacity. So what happened in the Sea Islands of South Carolina um, and, and Georgia, they're, they're, when you get in those situations, you have – it starts out as, as a language that for like a particular purpose. So again, that's, that's where the, the colonization and the enslavement comes in. It's like you need to understand something. You need to have some communication. And so you tend to have a mixing of languages. Now, all languages, if you go back far enough, are mixed. So right. that this is not – it's just sort of – it's a neat little like laboratory of, of sort of like longer, longer things. So you have where one language tends to be where a lot of the, the grammar or a, or a good portion of the grammar comes from. And then another language is where a lot of the vocabulary comes from. So we call that like the lexifier language. And lexicon is just a fancy way of saying vocabulary. So with, the, with, with Gullah, you have you know, words that, are, that sort, sort of were borrowed from English on – Grammar that is based on several different West African languages. Now, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but right. that's to get the point. So, so it is a it's sort of where, and then over time, that language for a particular purpose of just trying to communicate with people that you don't share the same language, it gets transmitted to children and and children. And you know, so over a, a couple of generations, a few generations, it goes from being a language for a particular purpose. So only you know for trade or for um, that colonization. And then it becomes and grows and grows and grows into a full-fledged, full-blown language that you can talk about art and literature and culture and feelings and hopes and dreams and sadness. And so it goes from something that you couldn't do that. So if you think about like the, the first few stages are like when you – as an English speaker, uh, travel abroad and you're trying to buy something at a market and you've got like 50 words in whatever language. That's how they kind of start. And then it grows and grows as it's transmitted to children and, it, and, and it's needed to be used in different things and it expands out. So in, uh, in the Sea Islands, um, you had um, an area that was, depending on the, the sort of the census records and the various records, was more than 80% enslaved Africans and about 20% English speakers. So it's a, you have to have that sort of, 
big population differences for Creoles to really um, take hold. And so that's what it is. So it's, it is a, it's an English-based Creole in, uh, in North America, and it's uh, found primarily in the Sea Islands of South Carolina and Georgia and inland into, uh, um, into uh, about Orangeburg um, in South Carolina. Is, there's a, there's a, a, a good population of speakers and people that are from that culture. And so uh, in the modern day, uh, these are the descendants of uh, formerly enslaved uh, people, and they, are, you know, they, they have Gullah. And again, it's, it's one of those things when you hear it, it sounds like you might understand way more than you actually do. Um, it's definitely something that if you uh, want to read more about it, there's um, a lot of really good stuff that's mm-hmm. coming out uh, and has come out over the last – honestly, like 50 years. So it's yeah. really, really just fascinating. And it's, it's something that is, um, there was a lot of stigma uh, for, you know, lots of reasons that we, we all could probably point to, yeah. but it, there's been a bit of a renaissance over the last couple of decades, which is just very gratifying to see um, a lot of pride in the language and in the culture. I did kind of want to ask the question in the South Carolina public radio article, you mentioned <clears> that <throat> once people feared that accents would kind of die out due to, <clears throat> radio and television and explain why that didn't pan out. So that's a really good, it, it's one of those things. It, it, it sort of makes intuitive sense, right? We, we watch the same shows. We, we, we listen to the same podcasts. We listen to the same radio stations. We watch the same movies. And so in some level, we would think that that type of sort of, you know, mass media that mm-hmm. people are getting the same kinds of, uh, of exposure that they would change, that they would sort of lose that distinctiveness. But that really hasn't happened. And part of the reason is we learn language through interaction. And if you think about, you know, like uh, uh, if you've been around, you know, your children or your nieces and nephews or someone else's children, they, they, they learn to talk through either observing interactions, participating interactions, you know, speaking with their parents, speaking with their siblings, speaking with their peers. And, and so that's how language is learned. You don't really learn language just by passively watching from like a screen or, or listening on a radio. Now, if you have – if you're really motivated and you're trying to learn like a second or a third language, you can. Right. But just when you're you know, nine months old to 18 months old to 24 months old, that's not really what you're doing, right? So the, the fact – is that people still interact, and those those regional varieties and the the, the, the differences are, are are there. Now, there the language is always changing, so there have been some changes and some differences that you know. So, like the the you know what we would call like the New South or the Modern South doesn't sound like the South of you know the nineteen teens, but it sounds like the South of today, and there's still lots of things that are shared. Uh, with those earlier varieties uh, of Southern speech, but there's also new stuff, and you know that 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 same thing holds true. So if you still, you know, if you cross the Ohio River, people don't sound like they're in, uh, you know, the, you know, they don't sound like they're Southerners anymore because you're not there, and, and mm-hmm. that those differences are still there. And in some places, the differences are are growing, and, and part of that comes from people want to sound like certain places, or they want to sound like certain groups. And then other groups don't want to sound mm-hmm. like other groups. Um, and so there's, a, there's this idea of speakers wanting to sound a certain way or not wanting to sound a certain way. Uh, uh, Dr. Reed, you got anything else, Seton? No, that's it. I've, this has been really, really interesting. Very cool. Uh, this will be my husband's yeah. favorite episode because he finds it fascinating. He, he reads everything he can about that I don't know what, whatever. Dialect. And dialect. He just loves it. He's so fascinated by it. An accent and dialect, are they the same thing? Um, Close? Kind of. So when we think about accent, we usually talk about just the sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, that some, you know, somebody has like a Southern accent or they have a Midwestern accent or something like that. And a dialect usually means more. Uh, it's not just the, the sounds. Oh. It's also maybe grammatical structures and, phrases. Um, and other things. Dr. Reed, it's been great, man. Dr. Yep. Reed, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. You. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, we hope you enjoyed and learned, and you can reach out to us when you feel the need. MurdochPodcast.com or on our Facebook page, which is Murdoch Podcast. And Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. Hit that follow button if you would. Make a little uh, comment and give us five stars, and we'll be happy.
Frontier presents a tale of two homes. I moved in with Frontier Gig Fiber and have been gaming and surfing up a storm with super fast speeds. And I moved in without it and haven't. So you don't have a 100% fiber optic network with 99.99% overall reliability? That's correct. 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 Well, it's never too late to upgrade. Don't just move. Move up. Switch to Frontier Gig Service for just $69.99 a month with auto pay and get a $200 Visa reward card on us. Go to Frontier.com slash moving for complete offer details. Services subject to availability and all applicable terms and conditions. Freedom is a feeling, and the best way to truly feel free is behind the wheel of a Jeep SUV. Find out what true freedom feels like at Jeep Freedom Days. Right now, get 2.9% financing for 60 months on the 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee WK. 2.9% APR financing for 60 months equals $17.92 per month per 1,000 finance for all qualified buyers across their capital regardless of down payment. Not all buyers will qualify. See dealer for details. Offer in 7-5-2022. Jeep is a registered trademark.